couple of months. I'm sure perhaps you've, you've experienced a, a wild couple of months already in your life. Maybe it's as a, as a youngster, right, where things have just been, been crazy busy, perhaps at, at school, with just a lot of homework and, and sports and things going on. Or maybe you're a little older than school age now, right? And, and you have those, those days or those weeks or, or months that go by where things are just unbelievably busy at work. And, and without fail, it's in those times, right, that then the, the wheels fall off and extra work gets piled on. And then you throw in a, a few unexpected things, things that you just never foresaw or, or never saw ever happening. That's when they happen, right? The, the car breaks down. Something at, at, at home breaks and, and requires, you know, something brand new to be either bought or fixed. And sooner or, sooner or later, you're just sort of left scratching your head going, wow, did not see any of this happening. It's been a, a little bit of a wild ride, right? The last however month amount of time. I imagine that must have been what the Israelites were feeling right before we, we hear what's going to serve as our, our text and also our Old Testament reading this, this evening. The Israelites had just seen uh, Moses come back from a 40-year absence. I imagine some of them figured they'd never see Moses again, and suddenly he's there and, and Moses says a few things to a few people, and suddenly their jobs become more difficult. They have extra work piled on by their Egyptian slave masters. And Moses starts talking about how the Lord is going to come and free his people from Egypt. I can imagine the Israelites already, after hearing Moses' words, right, kind of maybe scratching their heads going, yeah, okay, Moses. I'm interested to see how this is all going to work out. And then some, a few unexpected things begin to happen, right? The Nile turns into blood. Millions of frogs suddenly show up, right? Gnats, flies, darkness, locusts, cattle dies. As the Israelites saw those, those plagues come upon, they experienced some of them themselves, and witnessed others. And it gets to the point now where Moses comes to the Israelites and in essence says, all of these things are, are kind of getting wrapped up. There's going to be one more plague, and after that, the Lord is going to lead you out of Egypt. And this is how the Lord's going to do it. He says, then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. In other words, take an unblemished lamb, kill it, paint the doorframe of your home, eat the lamb with your family, and then tomorrow we're all walking out of here. You know what the Israelites were like in the wilderness, right? Grumbling, complaining, doubting God's promises, do you think there might have been a few of them who were a bit skeptical at what Moses had just told them? Even after all the plagues they had just seen. You want us to kill a lamb? Put the blood on the door, eat it, and tomorrow we're all just walking out of here. And yet, the Israelites did as Moses had said. They, they took that year-old unblemished lamb and sacrificed it. They took the blood, they, they put it on the, the sides and the top of the door frames of their homes. They ate that lamb with their sandals on their feet and with their cloaks tucked into their belts, ready to go. And they sat down and waited. And the Lord did just what he said he was going to do. You can imagine, perhaps, the wailing 
that go, went on that evening in, in Egypt, right? As mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, perhaps even grandparents saw their firstborn die, and yet the Israelites just stayed in their home and waited. And when morning came, what did the Israelites do? Walked out of Egypt. Man, you, you couldn't have helped, but perhaps as, as an Israelite, just to, to marvel at what the Lord had just done. Marvel that you were saved simply by the, the blood of a lamb being painted on the door. And because of that, the Lord said he was going to pass over your house. In fact, it was so significant that the Lord wanted the Israelites to understand it wasn't just this one Passover, but in doing so, he was giving his, his people another picture of something that was going to happen in the future, right? So he even tells the Israelites, he says, obey these instructions, excuse me, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Right, the Israelites just had to have, have marveled at how the Lord saved them. Right, he, he freed them from their slavery in Egypt led them out, and eventually was going to lead them to the land he had promised to give them. And throughout all that time, they were to remember how God had passed over them and saved them because of the blood of a lamb. In doing so, he was pointing his people ahead to another Passover. To another land. So it's no coincidence then on that Thursday evening as Jesus and his disciples gathered together, they gathered together to celebrate the Passover. To celebrate how, how God had once saved them by the blood of a lamb and freed them from their slavery in Egypt. And Jesus knew God's entire plan of salvation was coming to a head. That that picture of the, the Passover lamb being sacrificed and being the way that God passed over them and freed his people from their slavery in Egypt was really just a, a picture of how God was going to ultimately free everybody from a much bigger problem they had. Like the Israelites, you and I are slaves. Not to some Egyptian slave masters like, like the Israelites were experiencing in, in Exodus, but scripture tells us that because we were born in sin, we've been enslaved to sin. In other words, there isn't anything you and I do that isn't touched by our sinfulness. From the moment we were conceived, this is who we are by nature. And as much as we'd like to convince ourselves that, that we really aren't that bad or aren't that evil... Scripture has something different to say to us. It says to us, by nature, we're, we're hostile to God. We're, we're God's enemies, wanting nothing to do with him. And even as, as believers now, that sinful nature comes shining through far more often than we'd care to admit. At times, we'd like to justify our, our sinfulness, try to, to justify how, how we reacted or what we said or what we did was okay or well, at least understandable, considering everything else that was going on. But what God sees is sin. He sees people who by nature were enslaved by sin, and so God's solution was to send his son. A son whom John the Baptist pointed out and said, Look, the Lamb of God. And just as that lamb for the Passover was unblemished and without fault, so Jesus lived 
perfectly here on earth and was that perfect, unblemished Lamb of God. And just like in the Passover, where that Passover lamb was ultimately sacrificed and the blood shed in order to cover the door frames of the home so that the Lord would pass over, so the Lamb of God was sacrificed to take away the sin of the world. And the blood of that lamb, the Lamb of God, covers you and me so that death cannot touch us, so that the Lord passes over in judgment and instead looks at us through that blood and sees forgiven children of God, perfect and righteous, washed in our Savior's blood. Man, when we see that picture and we see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, man, we can't help but marvel, huh? can't help but marvel that we're saved simply by the blood of a lamb. And as he did with the Israelites, he he does for you and I. He attaches those beautiful promises to a meal. Right? In the Old Testament, he he wrapped up all of that into a meal where he he had the Israelites sacrifice a lamb, then eat it with with their, their sandals on their feet and their cloaks tucked in their belts, ready to go because the Lord was saving them from the Egyptians. And so he attaches that promise of forgiveness and life to a meal. To something you and I can taste and touch. It can be hard at times not to be skeptical, huh? As we look at it and we just see bread and wine Well, really, that that can save me? As I receive that bread and wine, Jesus is really forgiving my sins? And yet Jesus' words stand, don't they? On that Thursday evening, he, he goes to his disciples and he gives them bread and he says, this is my body. And gives them the wine and says, this is my blood. And in a special way, Right? Jesus, as he gives us his bread, that bread and the wine, gives us his body and blood. And as we do that, we receive the very body and blood of the Lamb of God who was sacrificed. And Jesus says, as a result, it's not just something you're doing in order to show your faith. It's not just something you do because Jesus commands you. But instead, here, Jesus is coming to you and saying, as you receive my body, and my blood, in, with, and under the bread and wine, your sin is forgiven. And as we come to the Lord's table, and we receive that bread and wine, and together with it, Christ's body and blood, we remember, don't we? We remember an unblemished lamb of God. We remember a lamb that was sacrificed. Blood that was shed. Sins that were forgiven. And as we remember, we can't help but marvel with the Israelites that were saved by the blood of a lamb. Amen. And the peace of God which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Savior Lutheran Church is located on the south side of Birmingham off Highway 280. We are on Dunnant Valley Road, about three quarters of a mile east of Treetop Family Adventure and Sports Blast. Our Sunday services begin at 1015 with Sunday School and Bible Class at 9 o'clock. We welcome visitors and hope to see you soon. For more information, please visit our website at OurSaviorBirmingham.com. Click on Sermons at the top of the page for a copy of today's service folder. You can also find us online on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.